Welcome back for those of you who have decided to brave another hour of this. Uh, I hear there are some other good talks. All right, so uh, just a quick recap of what we talked about the last 45 or the last hour or so. Um, so basically, Concept Slide is primarily, well, I say it's primarily motivated by the need for, for better diagnostics. I, that's just my perspective on it. Um, I'm sure that if you ask Bjarne, he will say that he had many other broader ideas in mind. But this is, this is the perspective that I come in from. Uh, so, Concept Slide basically we get this idea that we can constrain any template and some other things with this requires clause. So the question that I'm going to start asking is a little bit different now. I'm not going to, I'm not really going to show you what, what the next set of features, but I'm actually going to kind of ask, maybe, um, oh yeah, so for example, sorry, I just wrote these slides this morning. I haven't rehearsed them quite as well as I could have. So this is our previous declaration for our last talk. So you have a template, type name seek, type name function, requires that expression, and then you have the usual declaration. Apparently with a trailing for clause, ignore that. Uh, apparently I did write that this morning. Um, ignore the for loop. That's supposed to be a declaration. And we're going we're gonna to improve the way that this looks later by fixing the bugs. So the, um, what I actually want to talk about are the kinds of constraints that we really want to write. Because so far we've only written um, type traits. And type traits are, well, in my opinion, type traits are fairly uninteresting. But there are a bunch of different questions that we can actually ask about these types and these constraints. So, you know, is some type the same as another type? Is this type T in some set of types S? Or is type T a case, a special a pattern that matches type U? Or is T a subtype of T? A subtype of U. Wow, bugs. Um, yeah. T is technically a subtype of T, yes. So that's, that's an easy question to answer. Uh, and then, you know, this other question is sort of like, can I use T in this way? Which is uh, a very, very interesting question in and of itself. So, the reason I bring this up is that all of these constraints, these questions that we ask of types and constraints, it's not, it's not just a yes, no question. Really what we're doing is we're setting up an expectation within the context of that template that says, you know, here's my GCD function. I require T to be integral. It has to satisfy this is integral thing. And that automatically gives us this expectation that within that template that we can use T as, you know, a built-in integer type. It has plus, it has minus, it has the shift operators, it has, you know, modulus or whatever. And that all of those operators have the same basic meaning from, from one, one argument to the next. That any instantiation of this algorithm for type satisfying these constraints will be correct because we know that we're using the right objects, right, the right notation inside of this algorithm. Every constraint that you ask sets up some abstraction like this. Every constraint on types. Right. Now, th this leads very quickly to this discussion of, of separate checking which is to say that can you actually make the compiler learn about those abstractions and then go actually check the template definition against those abstractions? And the answer is uh, sometimes yes, it's difficult and it takes a long time. So you can, uh, we chose not to with Concepts Lite. And that's, this by the way is exactly why Concepts Lite is called Concepts Lite. We did not try to solve this half of the problem. It's not easy. Obviously, if you try to push back to an integer, you're not going to succeed very well. Yeah? The original concepts proposal did include, um, did include mechanisms to solve this. Um, we actually asked, because we have constraints and we can ask pretty much anything, we actually have a much broader problem to solve, unfortunately. I've made life difficult for myself. Or I've made life difficult for my student. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Braden's, Braden's um, honors thesis project is related to separate checking with concepts. Like. So we're going to try, to try to figure out how this actually works and we, how, how this is going to work in practice and how we can actually integrate this feature into C++ in, in sort of a non-intrusive way. There are some interesting things that happen if you just sort of flip the switch and make every template checked, um, which is that you pretty much have to adopt constraints or concepts in one shot. You don't, you don't really get a clean migration path. Um, from, from one version of concepts to the next. All right, yes? How would that proposed body checking differ from substitution failure already occurred? Substitution, substitution failure happens at the point of substitution. Separate checking happens as you parse the template definition itself. So it's checked separately from its instantiation. There is no substitution. All right, so these are the kinds of questions that we, that we want to ask. And let's, let's look at some of these abstractions that we're actually building up here. So is type T the same as you? 
The way that you might spell this in C++ today is to actually write standard is same. This is a type trait. And basically we're saying that T has exactly the same properties of, as U. This doesn't seem very generic, right? Like, hey, is T an int? Sure, why not? Um, but it turns out to actually be kind of helpful in certain cases where you want to like have a set of operations that return types, or possibly different types. And you need to say that they're actually the same type, like begin and end. And this is where I was going to point at Eric and he would tell me that I, Eric Niebler and he would tell me that I was wrong. Because apparently begin and end can return different types. But this is one place where, it used, where you would use that. Um, if, you, if you try to define a template like this, this is totally legal. You can do it. I just, I don't know what you're trying to get out of it. Because you can do this and it's basically the same thing, except this is not a template. So, I don't know. You, you can do it. It's interesting. They're not quite the same, you're right. Because this is not a template specialization, and therefore it is more specialized than that. So there's, there are some interesting, there's some interesting interplay that can happen with these things. I'm not, I'm not disputing that. It's just an interesting thing that falls out of the language. Um, okay, so we might ask, is type T a member of, se of, of uh, set of types S? So this, this abstraction is really a, a, essentially an idea that's sort of dominated by a set of types sharing presumably the same syntax and semantics. Um, we, we hope they're the same syntax and semantics, right? Now the way that we do this today, the, the typical approach to doing this today is the type traits. So here's integral, and it's actually defined like this in a lot of different library implementations. You basically just sort of enumerate the set by having a primary that says any, every type is not in the set except for oh, int is and long is and char is and, and all these other types. Right. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't really work so well for third-party libraries. We kind of talked about this in the last area, so, uh, hour. <coughs> so if you try to use this big int class with this type, um, obviously it will, it will not work because big int is not in the set of types named by standard, standard integral, that concept. That's that abstraction. Forget I said concept. Um, the other problem with this is, it, well, it, I mean, related to that, it's actually a closed set, right? If you want to go and extend the definition of the set, you actually have to go modify the definition, which actually is not that hard to do with partial temple specialization, but you still have to modify that set in some way. That's not actually a closed set. Yes? Just pointing out that you're not allowed to specialize the uh, standard type space, so letting the standard specific is allowed. Right. That's true, too. Yeah, you can't, you can't magically add new integer types to the language. That would not be a good idea. Um, so we, we also have these cases like is type T a case of U? So this is really, we're sort of defining an abstraction based on the shape of the type. So kind of what it looks like, how you spell it. And again, presumably all with the same syntax and semantics. Now there's really no good way of actually spelling this as a constraint. We can't say, it's not easy to write a type trait called is template specialization of. You can do it in, in special cases, but I, I opted not to and just to show you the sort of the vanilla version that we're all, we're all used to. So there's, there's sort of kind of an implied constraint on this function that whatever argument you supply must be a special case of vector of t. It has to be a specialization of this template. Okay. And of course, we all know that every specialization of vector works the same, and so therefore this algorithm is going to be correct no matter what arguments we provide, right? <laughs> now is your opportunity. <laughs> vector bool does not work with sort. Actually, is that true anymore? It's required to work, okay. Okay, it used to be that it did not work. So I'm, I'm behind the times, my apologies. Um, this, is one of the, this is one of the kind of questions that you get a lot in, in many, 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 many languages. Is T a subtype of U? Now, now uh, presumably we're gonna say that the subtype generally taken to be a base class. It doesn't really have to be. Subtype is actually a fairly general concept. It's just that in C++ subtype is sort of the, we, we tend to default to, to inheritance for that. We could also think about this in terms of conversion. We could. I don't want to, but we can. Um, so if you guys are familiar with Java generics or C-sharp generics or uh, any, any language that has subtype constraints on their, on their parameters, um, I think a lot of functional programming languages deal with this stuff. System F, is that right? Uh, so it, it kind of imposes, actually that's not quite true for system F. Um, so it kind of imposes this OO model on everything because if you're asking, for example, if everything has a base type, then all of your arguments that work with that thing actually have to be derived from something. And for, for whatever reason, this isn't really a good idea. Like maybe int doesn't have a base class. And it doesn't. And so maybe this idea isn't really the best way to express constraints for every single thing that you want to ask about an abstraction. It's very, very limiting. The number of things that actually go into a hierarchy in the C++ standard are very, very few. Yes? Well, most of our languages, even if you don't have multiple inheritance, you need to be able to 
Yeah. Yeah. Still useful. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna throw it out. So for example, we could do something like this. We can define sort which uh, as a template which requires some I sortable. A standard is based of would be a traditional way of asking for that. And that inside of that sort algorithm, then we know that we can rely on, on T to actually, or uh, S here, to actually provide the interface of that class because it's, it's derived from it. Now it becomes kind of interesting comparing that versus this. Um, if we were to go the other way, I think we could talk about type erasure, except that now we have sort of type preservation with the first one, right? So here you call sortable with, I don't know, vector or something like that, or you know, object-oriented vector, and you actually lose the static type at the call site. With this one, you actually preserve the, the, with the template, you actually preserve the static type of the argument at the call site. So it's, it's an interesting contrast, and you can certainly use this to very interest for solve a number of different problems. Although what exactly those are, I'm not quite sure. We haven't, we haven't really explored this too much. Ad hoc constraints are my favorite, because um, they're last. So we're, we have this question like, can I use T in this way? You know, can I, can I write this expression with an argument of type T or an operand of type T? Can I, can I access this member variable or this member function? Or can I access this uh, member type? Like, you know, T colon colon value type. Um, and so in, in C++11, we can, we can actually do this. It's not pretty. Has anybody tried writing one of these type traits that actually checks, like, has plus or get nested type name? You like it, right? It's fun. We love it. And it's not the, perp that's not the topic of this talk. So ask somebody else. There will be plenty of people around here who can help you do this if you really want to. I did it a long time ago. I will never do it again. It's awful. Um, okay. Walter will, Walter will tell us how to do this for C++14. Hopefully more elegantly than the way that I did it, because man, that's bad. All right, the, the end result of that is that, that this is actually, we, we might end up with something like this. So here's a, a function called add, and we, are, we require has, to, has plus. And I just want to point out that this is not really, and by any stretch of the imagination, uh, meant to be indicative of good generic programming style. It's actually quite the opposite of what you're looking for. You don't, you don't want things like has plus, plus. You want, you want sort of meaningful concepts. You know, I did. <laughs> I like my ads. I like my ads to be broken. So there are a couple of reasons why this is not an example of good of good practice. <laughs> Most useful function ever. So it turns out that these these um, these ad hoc requirements, or what I'm calling ad hoc requirements. They, they end up being sort of fundamental for this, the, what we generally perceive as, as generic programming for C++. The way that generic programming is practiced today is, is built on this idea that you can look at an algorithm or that you look at a generic algorithm and you lift up all of these little individual type constraints and then you, you express that as some cohesive abstraction. That's generally what we call a concept. And it allows reuse by similar but unrelated interfaces. And this, by the way, is Alex Stepanov, if you don't know. So what we call a concept today is really that set of requirements for an algorithm, the set of syntactic and semantic requirements for the algorithm. The syntactic, algorithm, or the syntactic requirements tell you what that algorithm is actually required to support, or the, the data type is required to support. Can I access T colon colon value type, or T colon colon iterator? Can I, can I add two things? Can I subtract two things? Can I pre-increment or post-decrement? So those are the kinds of things that the algorithm does. The other thing that we have inside of concepts or have with concepts are semantic requirements. And these are the supposed to be there to actually explain what those requirements are supposed to do. Or sorry, what those required operations are supposed to do. And actually that's not quite even the right way to phrase it. Those requirements actually explain what behaviors are required in order for the algorithm to be, in, in the way that Alex would probably phrase this, provably correct. Because if you don't have any guarantees on the semantics of those operations, then your algorithms do literally anything. It doesn't matter what the syntax is, you know, you just pull out your hard drive, no big deal. We like having semantics associated with those operators. And it's kind of interesting. If you think back about, about all those other types of abstractions that we can define through those questions, those kinds of constraints, we can actually go back and pin the semantics of those required operations to something, somewhere, except with these things. You know, if it's a subclass, you're asking for a subtype constraint. There is a virtual method somewhere in that class that you can point to and say that is the meaning of that operation. If it's the same type, well, it's the same type, so they're the same. The, the, the requirements are explicit. If it's, if it's in a set or if it's a vector, then we kind of hope that the, we can point to an operation and say, we hope this works. 
there's an opportunity to break things in there a lot by, because we have C++ and the language is flexible enough to do that, but the idea is that we need to be able to provide these semantic constraints to say what those operations actually do. And I'm gonna point this out. This is like my one slide that actually talks about concepts. This is like the, the summary of N3351, the, the concept designed for the STL, in one slide. Concepts are most useful when they occur in a lot of different algorithms at the same time. So if you have a bunch of algorithms that share common, common syntactic requirements, common behaviors, then you really want a concept that describes what those algorithms, what those requirements actually are, what that abstraction actually is. Um, you know, we, we can certainly define one-off concepts. It's not a big deal. Like I have a template. I should probably have a concept. Except that that one-to-one -one mapping kind of leads to this idea that you have a million concepts. That seems kind of skewed. All right, so what are the actual requirements of all? <coughs> I, know, I know that previously we've said there that's a, a sequence and predicate, but that's actually not correct. And in order to actually find out what we want to require, we have to look at the implementation and figure out what's allowed. So the first thing we'll look at is the four. <coughs> right? So for the, the range-based for loop, aha, range, um, it requires you to be able to use call standard begin, it requires you to call standard n on s, or some sequence type x, and it returns some value, and we're just gonna call that value i. Both of these functions return some value. Syntactically, we also require that that return value can be incremented through plus plus i, and that we can dereference it and bind it to a const l value reference to some type, which we're gonna give a name to in a little while. These are the syntactic requirements of, of a range-based for loop, specifically of this range-based for loop, by the way. You can modify those. We also have this statement. So here we have some function f, and it's called with x. So it has to be at least take an argument of type x, has to return something that can be explicitly, explicitly converted to bool. Right? Now, we could go through the exercise of looking at a whole bunch of algorithms to do the same thing, and then try to find good names for these, but we're gonna kind of skip ahead and say we've already done that because we have. So sequence is really a range, that sequence type. Generally, we've been referring to these things as ranges, uh, although again, Eric Niebler would probably correct my notation, and Sean Parent would probably throw something at me. So basically, it has something called begin and end, and it returns, the, the, the result type of those operations is something, uh, well, let's just call it some type iter. Iter is required to be an input iterator, mean, at least in this algorithm, meaning that you can increment it and you can dereference it to find the result to const L value reference. And then predicate is, uh, sorry, uh, function is actually interesting because it's a unary predicate. Um, but not specifically just, or not generally just any predicate, it's actually a predicate on the value type of the iterator um, that returns, that returns bool, so that's what a predicate is. Right. So we can actually write these things like this. This is, this is what we, how we actually write this guy out. So requires range of R, the input iterator, or sorry, Range is a concept, input iterator is a concept, and predicate is a concept. The things in blue are alias, uh, uh, template aliases, or alias templates, alias templates, uh, that, that provide access to, to some of the required operations. It's just notational. These are actually pretty easy to define. Yeah? No. It doesn't. Because if you had a, a range-based for loop that for every element x you wrote star uh, x equals o, so you're assigning to every element, then it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be readable. You have to write through it. It's a different requirement. Okay. So, still a bit verbose. We're gonna, we're gonna work on this as we go. All right, so the question is, how do we actually define these things? Um, fortunately, we provide support for this. So if you think that I'm going to sit up here and start talking about type traits, no, we are not doing that today. All right, so we actually did end up adding language support to help you define these things. I go through a bunch of slides pretty quickly. So in concept slide, a concept is simply a named constraint. Um, it's basically a variable, it's one of two things. It's a variable template uh, whose initializer is a constraint expression, or it's a nullary function template with a single return statement uh, that is all, that's also a, a constraint expression. So we have some fairly, some fairly draconian restrictions on these things. Um, concepts are interesting because they don't actually get instantiated ever, it turns out. So you can't explicitly specialize them, you can't, you can't partially specialize them, you can't explicitly instantiate them. It is a single definition that defines a constraint on template arguments. That's the only way it gets used. They can't be recursive, they have to return bool, other things. 
So this is how you would actually specify a concept as a variable template with concepts like. We actually ended up adding a new, a new expression here, which I'll talk about in a second. So, ready? Concept is now a, uh, a, a declaration specifier. It means that the following declaration is going to be a concept which has special meaning and special restrictions. Uh, it can be applied to function templates, it can be applied to variable templates, it can be applied to nothing else. Uh, not, no member function templates either. Not even static. All right, this thing is a requires expression. So this is a new, a new primary expression in C++ grammar. Basically, this is gonna introduce a, uh, a set of requirements. Um, the, the parameters here given as T range are simply provided for notation to help us write these constraints. They are not actual objects. They have no lifetime. They have no linkage. It is purely to convey, actually, how many of you guys are familiar with Decalval? This gets rid of Decalval. The only purpose for that was to get rid of Decalval because I hate it. It's awful. <laughs> All right, so we have th two different types of requirements in this concept. The first one is a type requirement. So basically, if you write type name something, that requires <coughs> that when you substitute into that something, you get something that names a type. You basically get a, you get a type out of it. So if you try to substitute, uh, if, you, if, you, if you try to ask for the iterator type of an int, for example, Hopefully this type doesn't define anything, you'll get a substitution failure, which would be effectively the same as false. These things in, in curly braces on the left, um, they, they wrap an expression. So the, the, it's braces, expression, arrow, type. These are valid expression requirements. When you substitute into a valid expression requirement, if that doesn't return a valid expression, if that doesn't yield something that actually compiles, which is kind of a, not a great way of saying that, um, it, it, it fails. Right, so again, if I, if I ask to see if begin or end of, of zero is true, then those end up being false. Yes? Do you know if it's standard begin or any of begin in this case? Uh, in this case, it's standard begin. Um, you can do that with, uh, with some extra namespace stuff. Yeah? Result type is convertible to, to T. Yeah. Yes? No. <laughs> Next. All right, so this is what it would look like if you were to define it as a function. Yeah. No, the, the expression on the left must be convertible to the type on the right. Right, but I mean, if it's convertible, then there's like, what do you So I can have an example of a type requirement on this slide? <laughs> Yes, it can be a concept. No, that's not implemented because that requires the, uh, the more advanced auto stuff that, that's not quite implemented in your CC yet. But yeah, so you can say uh, begin and end arrow, arrow input iterator, for example, and that works out okay. What, auto? Yes. Sure you can. I've just said you can. <laughs> iterator type is a type alias type here. It's an alias. Oh, so it's it's not, a, not a concept. If you wrote arrow input iterator T, or sorry, actually if you wrote arrow input iterator semicolon, that would say the result type must satisfy, is something that satisfies the constraint of requirements of, a, of, a, of that concept. You can do that. There are no examples of that in this talk. For all intents and purposes, let's go with no. You can actually write it inside of a requires clause, so you end up with requires requires, and I left that in there on purpose as a way of punishing people who want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, a, a requires clause is not valid anywhere outside the scope of a concept. And there's a very, very good reason for that, which is that you have no guarantees that these will ever be able to compile anywhere outside of a very limited context in a language. So we, we put giant box around them and say you must, these, these belong to them. All right, so this is what it looks like if you don't <coughs> define it as a function. Excuse me. And obviously the next question is, well, why do you have functions and variables? 
And it turns out that we actually started with functions um, because that's just what C++ had at the time. There were no variable templates when we started this. Um, and actually it turns out that if you do use functions for concepts to define concepts, you get things like being able to overload on, on template parameter arity. So you can have like equality comparable of T and equality comparable of T and U. Works out fine. If you really want to, you can write things like equality comparable zero for template, not like non-type template arguments. Works out fine. Um, then we got variable concepts in Bristol and uh, people decided they didn't want to write the parentheses, so we ended up making those concepts also. And now you have two ways of writing it. It happens. Uh, just another quick uh, example of a concept. This is the predicate concept, just to show that these actually work with variadic templates. So predicate is a, uh, is a concept. The first argument is your function object or your function pointer or your, your callable or whatever. Arg is just a sequence, sequence of things that you want to try to call with it. And so if you want to know if you can call pred with args, you write, you know, pred of args dot 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 expands. And if when you substitute that turns out to be valid, then it's a concept is satisfied. If not, then it's, then it's not. Yes? I, you, you could put one in. I just didn't because it's, it would push it off the side of the slide. I'm making, I'm making some, um, some, some sacrifices for readability here. You would, have, you would, of course, use the notation that you want to use that you actually need for your concept. And I, I, I believe that you're going to end up with some forwarding in there, although I'm not 100% sure of it. Although, you know, actually, now that I think about it, maybe not. Maybe not. The code is never run. Right. It's never run. So R value, X value, GL value might not matter. Um, if pred only takes R value reference parameters, then I think that you would, oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about that one. Yeah. Um, so with move only types, you, if you, if, if the type of args is actually ref ref, then these things get pushed down and I think you may actually synthesize the right types in the expression, but you would actually need a move or a forward to, to cause those to propagate into the, into the lookup, yeah. Yeah, in fact, we actually do that with, move, with uh, the move constructor stuff. So yeah, you, you do need move and forward in some cases. All right, so now we have this interesting question. What happens now? We have this nice new fancy support for, uh, for defining concepts. How does this play with the, uh, with the diagnostic system? Well, uh, again, you know, obviously you can't call all with those values because we completely misunderstood the documentation of the function. And uh, we actually get some very interesting output. Um, so, for example, this will actually tell you that the concept range of int is not satisfied because with these values, this is not a valid expression, that is not a valid expression. The concepts, that are the, the diagnostics that you get out of concepts are extremely, extremely uh, precise because we can define them like this. There's actually special notation that exists in the language that allows you to reconstruct error messages that reflect precisely where the failures actually went wrong. Of course, I'm lying. <laughs> um, unfortunately, this green statement doesn't actually show up anymore. I changed the way that things are processed and it kind of slipped away. It used to say this, so I don't feel too bad, but it'll come back. Um, and we can actually do a lot better. Uh, I, I, designing diagnostics has never been an easy thing. It's, it's actually quite difficult if you've ever tried it. Um, figuring out what to diagnose and how much to diagnose and, and what the right way to say these errors are, are can, be, can be fairly difficult. But the one thing I can tell you is that if you have requirements like this has to be convertible to that, like T must be convertible to you, and you fail that, that actually shows up in the error message. Int is not convertible to string, for example. So we can actually pull the, the, the diet messages directly out of those, those constraints, yes, requirements. It will, so currently we will diagnose every failure from any, any requirement in the constraint. So it'll do a full analysis. And if, if you actually go grab the current version and run this code, you'll, you'll see a bunch more stuff in there that I've kind of taken out because I don't know like where it's coming from. It just sort of <laughs> slips into the, uh, 
slips into the output. So I need to go back through with a, with a, with a comb and make sure I'm getting the right stuff. Okay. One of the other, one of the other things that we get with the, the concept keyword is actually sort of an odd thing. We get the ability to actually recognize concepts in different places than just as, a, as part of an expression. So now we're actually going to make this simpler. Right? Now, one of the new features that comes in with, uh, with concepts is the ability to take the, the, the concept name and use it to declare a template parameter. So if I have a function called sort, I can just say sortable container, and that says this is basically going to be type name t, because that's how concept, the sortable container concept can be defined. And uh, the meaning of that is actually just going to be this. So it declares type name t, and it, you have sortable container of c. So it actually just it, it introduces the parameter and then, then checks it. It's a nice shorthand declaration. And it's, it's precisely equivalent. If you declare one and then you declare the other, they are actually redeclarations of each other. Yes? It can be used with template, template parameters. It can be used with non-type template parameters. Yeah. Um, C cannot be deduced to be an O value reference type in this case because it'll match. It does, and 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 forwarding and, and concepts do not actually play very well together because of that. That that little adjustment to the uh, the forwarding rule um, means that you sometimes get L value references or const L value references in your constraints, and it doesn't. It, it can break things because a reference type isn't you know copy constructable, so things break. Um, you, you basically need an alias type to strip away the, the L-value reference system and forward that into the concept, unfortunately. Uh, I thought about it and I chose not to do that because there, there may be cases where I actually want that reference type to be preserved. Like if you ask for copy constructability, you want to say const t ref, and if you automatically strip it away, it's, it's lost. Um, it's, I, I, I admit, it's, that's one of the things that, that's kind of like bothering me about, about this, but it, it's okay for now. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and, and... Right, yeah. That's, I, that currently, that's actually true. But remember, I'm going to point out that the shorthand notation is not a replacement for the template syntax. Right? There are still templates that we want to write that don't... This doesn't really work that well. I have better examples of that. So if this is our declaration, we can go ahead and just lift that first constraint up and get the range of R. And then I think the next one we probably want to work on is the predicate, so we'll, that'll just look like this, right? Uh, oops, no, we, we seem to have lost a little bit of information. Because it's not, P isn't just a predicate, it's actually a predicate on the value type of the range. And so in order to specify that, you just kind of, you, you do this. And so the way that you always interpret these things is that the declared parameter is actually, ends up being the first argument of the constraint when you check it. So range of R, and then predicate P value type, and it turns out to work. I'm not, I don't know if I'm 100% fond of the syntax, but it actually does simplify things a little bit. It's not too bad. You just kind of got to train yourself to rethink that stuff. Question? So do we have the ability to take any kind, like declare a template parameter that takes any kind of type or, or non-type or template? I think you, I think that I think that you can actually do that. I think that I think that the language actually allows you to do that. Yeah. Well, you just change predicate to a different concept and you just pass it R instead of value type. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can totally do that. 
Remember, we can, we can define concepts to be pretty much whatever we want. There is, this is just a very simple transformation. Right? So if you, if you want to be, be inventive with your, your concept definitions, you can, you can actually get a lot of interesting things out of this, including, I think, stripping out R value references from a forwarded thing, uh, L value references from a forwarded argument. Um, so for example, if, if we end up using these concepts a lot, we might want to define a new one, and this is kind of where, where this idea comes. We want to get rid of the last constraint here, right? So we can actually define a new concept called an input range or in range because it fits better in the slide. Uh, this just requires R to be a range and its iterator type to be uh, an input iterator. And so then we can actually lift the entire set of constraints into the declaration in one shot. So now range is defined as in range R and then the, this, this predicate thing. Now, sometimes we have lots of algorithms that have exactly the same kinds of requirements and the exact same kinds of template parameters. So we actually figured that, you know, if, if we're going to, well, why, why bother continually redeclaring the same stuff over and over and over again? A lot of typing. So we went ahead and added notation that allows you to actually declare, essentially to reintroduce a concept or a constrained set of template parameters. And that's, that's this notation. It's called the concept introduction. So all, none, and some, or all of, any of, some of, if you're, uh, uh, or none of, if you're in the standard library, they all have exactly the same template parameters. They all have exactly the same constraints. Um, so we can actually use this notation to, to just sort of skip over the usual template declaration header. Now query is nothing spectacular. It's not, it's not very interesting. It's just, it's just a concept declared here as a function. Uh, and it just requires R to be, so it has two parameters, R and P, requires R to be an in range and the, the, again, the predicate. So basically this stuff, uh, that stuff. And then this declaration uh, of all is actually exactly equivalent to this one. So it just expands. Whenever you, so when, when you introduce a template through a concept introduction and declare a template through a concept introduction, you basically end up redeclaring all of the template parameters in, in that concept locally for the, the following declaration. And then the entire concept name acts as a constraint on those parameters. Now, it might seem a little bit uh, odd that we would do this, like how many, how many times does this actually happen? Like does this, does this give you any big savings? It turns out that yeah, it does. You guys know how many algorithms or different flavors of algorithms are in the STL? Like there's what, 110 algorithms, I think? 112, something like that? You know how many different variations there are that we can, that we can do this with? Like a dozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we sort of reversed the usual. I mean, we kind of, we, when we were looking at the syntax for it, like, well, we could just make it look like a macro where you would sort of do, you know, query with parentheses and then it would sort of expand the same way. We ended up with the braces because it was, it was too macro-y. We didn't want to confuse people. Although I think that, that might end up being confusing to others. Uh, who had a, somebody had a question. Okay. Yeah. You cannot forward declare a concept. Concept must be defined at the point of declaration. Yes? No. No, we have not added another Turing complete. No, no, and I, I will tell you why. That, that constraint expression is based on, on a very, very simple logical language that does and, understands and, and it understands or. That's the only things that we, those are the only things that you can reason about in the constraint language inside of the compiler. That we will, it will never be Turing complete. It will never even approach being Turing complete because then you get to this weird like undecidable logic and you can't effectively do overload resolution for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you if you're looking for more ways of writing uh, GCD or something like that. So if all of that is still too verbose for you, then you can, you can actually use a concept name as a type specifier. So if sortable container is a, is a concept, then we can just write sortable container C. And this will actually, that means this, pretty straightforward. And of course that means this. And all of these declarations are exactly equivalent. They're the, they're the same thing. It's just notation. Now, uh, it, it's to sort of mirror the, the features that we get with auto, same idea, right? So we can declare f of some concept, you can declare a vector of some concept, and then a function pointer taking 
taking an other concept and returning a sum concept. And the meaning is basically the same as you would have before, except you're just lifting the constraints in these cases. So the first one, sum concept just becomes a constraint T. This becomes a constraint T. Uh, so you have a vector of this. And this one becomes uh, essentially that. So again, a very simple transformation, very straightforward. Um, really nothing very, very difficult about this. Well, um, so just adding constraints to a declaration does not make anything provably correct. You still got to get your pen and paper out and work through the actual proof of correctness for that. Um, and there, there has been some work on actually supporting, and to some extent, um, reasoning about the correctness of code specifically based on, on a definition of concepts. In fact, this is um, Gabriel Dos Reyes' work. That's down the road. Down the road. This this will not do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, because this is implemented in GCC. You could use GCC too. No, I, I mean C plus plus is already hard to parse. You can't you can't parse C plus plus without doing context lookups anyways. You have to consult your context if you want to know your next parse. Uh, this just this this just builds on the same system. Yeah. Or what? Oh yeah, yeah. These can definitely go in namespaces. Yeah. An alias? Oh no, no. Uh, uh, I think we had that question earlier as to whether or not uh, if a constraint mentioned an expression in in some other namespace, should that namespace be pulled into the set of associated namespaces? And I think the answer was no. And then I saw a thumbs up in the background. So. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm still leaning towards no just because I don't have to do any more work. <laughs> All right. So the, the goal of the shorthand is just to simplify these things. We want to make, we make simpler things simpler. Um, and you'll probably hear a talk on that tomorrow if you have CBRNA. Don't, don't think this is a replacement for template syntax, please. Uh, th there are certainly ways that you can use this, this code to, to make your, your stuff worse like a lot worse, like this. Um, which is exactly why I went to sortable instead of predicate, or instead of the all thing. Yeah, so you can do that, sure it works. Instead of, instead of this being a type, it's just the decal type of R, yeah. It's pretty, right? Don't do this. This is not a good use of, not an effective use of, of, of shorthand notation. Please do not do this. If I see in a mailing list somebody say, Andrew told me to write my programs like this, I will find you. <laughs> we'll have words. All right, the one, one last thing that I'm, that I'm gonna get a bunch of questions on. Uh, we, we have a rule that if you declare two variables with the same concept, then they have the same type. Or two parameters with the same concept, they have the same type. Now I know, I know that you think, well auto doesn't work that way. Why doesn't this follow the same rule that auto does? And I will just point out that auto is magic, and we can define it to have whatever meaning we want. When a user defined name is actually used as a type, you generally don't expect that type to change mid declaration. Right? If I say void f int int, that name int doesn't have different meanings between the, first, between the first parameter and the second parameter. I would be very surprised if it did. So this rule exists specifically to improve consistency with, with type ints. We want these things to look like types. In, in when they're used. Yeah. But. You're wrong. You're wrong. No. <laughs> You're done. I actually had a slide that said, but, and then it came across the giant words, wrong. No. It, it, I'm, I'm serious. This, this is the way it is. This is actually a good idea. Yeah, Alistair. Well, typically, if a different writer than that would write it, suddenly the strength of being rendered in the same file. Yeah. Seems to be a, a reasonable pull out. So there was, there was a paper last year from uh, Botan Ballo and myself that was proposing an extension of, of this notation to allow you to differentiate these things. 
it turns out the syntax is completely incompatible with concept introductions, don't tell Botond yet. Um, but so we need to adjust the syntax of it, but it would be, it would be a tiebreaker for these things. And it's actually, it's not bad. Like you just put a new type name after the concept, like uh, you could write input iterator, I don't know, like colon T, input iterator colon U, and then they would have different type names. Yeah. <laughs> um, they would be different, yes, because they have different spelling. Other questions? Okay. So the rest of this talk is about overloading and specialization, the interesting stuff. So Concepts Lite supports two different methods of, of sort of opening up, uh, opening up a definition for extension. One is refinement. You guys, this is probably the most familiar for you. The other is generalization. I should probably call it coarsening, because if you have refine and coarse, it's a nice opposite antonym. But I, I stuck with generalization. So refinement, you're, you end up strengthening a concept by adding additional requirements, right? So if we have, a, if we have an input iterator, or if we, we can define a bidirectional iterator by taking an input iterator and then adding, adding to that a set of requirements for decrement. Yes? Well, technically, they're both true. But yeah, forward iterator, sure. We're just skipping forward iterators today. They don't exist. Right. So if you think about these things in terms of their sets of constraints, and by, by, by sets of constraints I mean if you, if you dig down through all of those concept names, all those template IDs, and you pull out the individual requirements that show up in, in the, the, the requires expressions. Those are the requirements that we're talking about. These, these sort of very atomic, like here's a fragment of syntax that has to be valid. Here's a type name that has to be valid. Here's a conversion that has to be valid. Those are the sets of constraints that we're talking about here, these, these atomic constraints. Then we can actually think of the bidirectional iterator. See, I'm continuing with this, no forward iterators. Uh, then, then we can kind of think about the, this refinement as actually just being the union, the set union of, of these sets of constraints. Do not confuse this with, the, with sets of types, which is kind of an interesting dual relation. Uh, these are sets of constraints. It's easy to do. I confuse myself sometimes also, right? And so, we can say that bidirectional iterator refines input iterator because it has more constraints. It's, it's an input iterator, forward iterator, plus a little bit more. You can think about it that way. I know that this is clearly more than this union picture, but I, I like the circle. Right. Now this is, this is by far the most, most common types of, uh, of extension you're gonna run into. Um, and I, I say by far, and I, I really don't mean that this happens all the time. Like the number of cases of refinement actually existing in the standard library is really not that big. There's the iterator hierarchy. Uh, there's the container hierarchy. See? I mean, technically there's copy and move, and we can make a hierarchy out of that too, but um, yeah. It just does, it doesn't happen all the time. Probably with some of the threading stuff, I'm not very familiar with it yet, so I, I, I would need to be educated there. So generalization is actually a little bit different. So here we can actually weaken a concept by removing, removing constraints. So for example, I might actually define iterable as a container or a range. And I'm not really removing constraints, I'm just taking the disjunction of these things. But it definitely defines a weaker concept. So here, iterable is weaker than either container or range. Um, if you think about it, and assume there's a way to differentiate a container and a range. So if you, if you think about it, um, you know, container has some operations, a range has some operations, and somewhere in the intersection of those, those sets of constraints, we have, we have begin and end, right? Now, that disjunction actually defines the concept, the, the sort of unnamed concepts at the inter, unnamed concept, the intersection of these two sets. That's what this, that's what disjunction actually does here. It's not really used very commonly, so why did you support it? Well, because it was easy and because it turns out we think it has actually very useful applications, especially when you talk about bridging libraries together. So if I can define an algorithm that takes you know, a set of types from your library and a set of types from my library, then instead of trying to define a new concept that refines both of them, you just say, well, it's either this or that, and let, you know, sort of let the users figure it out. So we, we think it's going to be useful. Um, I will point out, however, that heavy use of disjunction actually comes with a penalty, the pile time penalty. The, the algorithms required to decide these things uh, for overload, resolution, partial specialization can be uh, quadratic, I think, or is it exponential? It grows. But we haven't seen this be a problem in practice yet. Um, just, just don't define a concept to be like at the, at the lowest level 
you know, A or B or C up to you know, 30 or 40 things. That's, that's probably not a good idea. Don't define is integral as int or care or don't do that. All right, so why does all of that matter? Well, it, it turns out that it matters um, because we actually want to be able to overload and specialize based on these things. And the rule that we actually use to do this is, is actually based in logic. It's not, it's not really set theory, it's actually, it's logic. So if we can determine, if the compiler can determine that for some constraint C, whenever some constraint C is true, we can determine that D is also true, then C is a stronger constraint than D, or C refines D. And if you go, go get elements of programming by Stepanov, that's exactly how he defines um, defines refinement as, as a logical implication. So this actually lets us extend to, to do some very interesting things. Um, oh, and I will point out that an unconstrained template, you know, just template type name T, whatever, is always less constrained than any other constrained template. It's the, it's the least constrained of all. all right, so for example, if we wanted to find advanced, we can do it this way. You just, uh, you, you naturally define it in terms of the concepts that you, you want to use. So there's an advance for input iterators, there's an advance for bidirectional iterators and for random access iterators. And each one of these, as you work down that hierarchy, that refinement hierarchy, it either weakens the precondition of the previous one or it strengthens the postcondition. Right? Bidirectional iterator, the bidirectional overload weakens the precondition for advance. It allows you to go backwards. You can actually advance by negative numbers. Uh, the, the random access iterator, the postcondition, the effect is that it happens in constant time. And then when you call these things, the compiler actually compares the constraints of the algorithms to figure out which is the best given those arguments. So if I have a linked list and I get an iterator to it and I advance it. So the input iterator overload is valid. The bidirectional overload is valid. Bidirectional iterator overload is valid. The random access iterator, I should say viable. The, the random access iterator is, overload is not viable because list does not provide random access iterators. And so between the two that we have left, input iterator and bidirectional iterator, we have to choose the one that's the, the, the most constrained. So we actually look and actually compute logical implications on these things to determine whether or not input iterator implies bidirectional iterator or bidirectional input iterator apply, implies uh, input iterator. And it turns out the latter is true and so that one gets selected. Um, similar idea for template specialization. Uh, here I have an unconstrained base class or unconstrained, sorry, not base class, unconstrained primary and two specializations, C Elster, I told you it was gonna come back. So we actually have a real complex number with some concept real, and I have a, an integer complex number or a Gaussian integer, and again, these are specializations. So for any specialization satisfying those constraints, the compiler chooses which one is most appropriate based on the satisfied constraints. It's actually easier in this case because real and integer are, are disjoint, they don't, there's no overlap. There better not be any. Otherwise, you always get ambiguous cases. All right, so taking advantage of these ideas, and I, this is only a very topical uh, discussion of that stuff, but taking advantage of these ideas actually requires you guys to think about the, sort of the way that C++ deals with specialization as a whole, and figuring out where, where concepts actually fits into this model. Right? So the way that we actually do it today, this is C++ 11 or 14 or whatever. So at the, at the most general, we have kind of like any type. You know, below that we have sort of specialized types and then concrete types at the very bottom. This is my, this is my usual pyramid of specialization. It, well, it's triangle specialization, I guess. Right, so at the top we might have, you know, template with type name T or an auto. So something unconstrained. It, it accepts anything. And for the specialized type we can think about patterns, you know. And again, we're back to these questions. These are, these are, you know, is this a case of that? T star is a pattern. Vector T is a pattern. In the very bottom we have concrete types. And if you actually go and build a function that has overloads for each of these, you can actually work out the specialization relation for them. Because if you declare a function that takes an int star, it will always be called when it takes an int star. For any other pointer t star, that'll get called. And then for any, any arbitrary t, that'll get called. So the specialization hierarchy is built in. So where does concepts fit into this? Any guesses? Gaps between. That's why I left space there, right? So, more specialized than any type is a constrained type. More specialized than any constrained spe any specialization is a constrained specialization. So if you think about type name T here, then in this case, we might have a, a template parameter declared with a concept in the shorthand notation. Or instead of auto, you might just use the, the constrained type specifier con. Or any requirement of, of the form requires concept of T. 
So these are one step more specialized than, than, than sort of abstract or generic types. Specialized types are the same. Constrained generic types, we can actually start adding those concepts to the types inside of there. And so you, you, you build, it's, it, it's, it layers out like this, that you can actually add sort of syntactic requirements to patterns so you can actually build these very interesting hierarchies. And again, concrete types. Yeah. So if I've got a um, series of functional overloads that can say seven arguments each. Yep. And they're all a variety of these different types. Is it just a weighting in the algorithm for the cardinal ordering? No, you, you, you do specialization by type first. And then if you have any, any leftover candidates that are still uh, equivalently as specialized, then you start comparing um, constraints. So you always do by type first and then you go to constraints. All right, so how do you actually use this? Last, last couple of slides, I promise. Uh, this is the value type type trait. I like this one. So if the, the, the base of this is basically just gonna be a type trait. Uh, it's, it's a primary template, it's unconstrained, it has no definition because we like leaving off definitions when we don't have associated types. We have a definition for a constrained type, so I'm, I'm assuming that there's a concept or something called member value type. This guy is just the more specialized version of, of this. That should, mm, that should say using uh, type name T colon colon value type, I, I apologize. And then for specialized types, for built-in types like pointers or arrays, we can actually define these things as, as a match against the pattern. And so if you call this for any type, you get nothing. If you call it for some type that happens to have a nested member associated value type, it'll pick that one. And if you happen to pick it for pointers, it'll always pick the pointer over the, the, the specialization. So you can actually define this type trait very straight, very simply by, by relying on sort of this idea of how concepts and types interplay. In fact, that's actually the way that Origin does this, the Origin library. All right, so Concepts Lite briefly, very summarily does this stuff. Um, I, I will mention that it actually does, I did mention that it improves compile times in a kind of weighted test, uh, unfair test. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I actually left out for a good reason, because then I'd have a third hour to talk, or a fourth, and I'm, I'm getting kind of tired. Um, so I didn't talk about what makes a good concept. I, I didn't talk about what makes a good generic library. These, these, are, these are topics that can very easily fall out of this discussion or follow on this discussion. Um, new programming gotchas, they, they happen all the time. There's a whole host of new features that people are gonna mess up or that people are gonna confuse and do the wrong thing. Um, I mentioned a couple of those. Uh, I, I have no new and clever programming techniques for you, fortunately. Um, there's, a, it's, it's, there's a lot here. And there's a lot, of, there's a lot of room for people to figure out how to do things the right way and, and how to do things the wrong way. Um, so maybe next year I'll come back and, and tell you what I've learned in the, in the past year. Uh, other questions? Yes. Oh, uh, like virtually zero? Yeah, I don't care. No, don't, I don't care. I'm not interested in Haskell type classes. I'm not interested in Java generics or C sharp generics. I'm interested in solving the problem that C++ has. Was that not the answer you were expecting? Well, I mean, that happened, that happened in, the, in, in, in the 2000s, right? We had C++ OS concepts. And that was actually based on a really rigorous study of other programming languages' language, other programming languages' features. And that work had been done. So where's the value? What's the value in me redoing it? It was good work, but I, I didn't see a need to continue down that path. Other questions? Yes. I hope, fingers crossed, yeah. I don't know about Clang's plan, but if you ever see Herb talk about planning for Visual Studio, it always, concepts always shows up in the bottom right corner. Um, so I, I'm strongly of the opinion that Microsoft will be working on an implementation soon, if not already. I, I don't know the details. Yes. <laughs> I actually knew that. I didn't know if I could say it. Uh, so yeah.
Yes. Yeah. Right. Technically, you can use both at the same time. I do not recommend it unless you absolutely have to. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it looks weird, but yeah. Yes. Uh, from right, you I, ask that one more time. Yeah. But I didn't see any of these slides for that proposal of getting the wire taken out. Uh, it seems like it would be a challenge. Um, it's kind of been replaced by having a solar that kind of goes in the wire. Well, auto, auto just expands to an empty set of constraints. Like it, it's just, it invents a template parameter and then there, there are no constraints associated with it. So you can actually mix and match. You can have, you can have constraint type specifiers like the concept name, then you can have auto and you can have another concept name. So you can, it, it's just, it's a very, it, you basically just turn a crank. Whenever you see one of those, you create a template parameter. If there's, it's a con, if it's a concept name, then you generate a, a constraint that goes into a requires clause. So if you've done auto, if you can't. If you've written auto, uh, so you, if you've written auto, you can actually stick a constraint after a function, after the, after the declarator, and use decal type to, to refer to the declaration. You can do that. I don't do that. Other questions? Yes. You can, I mean, you can write negation, so you can write not whatever, but there's no, there's no like deeper logical meaning to it. It's not, we don't, we don't actually try to negate a syntactic requirement. It just takes, it takes it as an atomic, it takes the entire negation as an atomic expression. So it's either true or false. That's all. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you can, you can negate things. Substitution fa a substitution failure is always a substitution failure. Um, yeah, yeah. You can't you can't recover from that. Tell me really yes. This did not subs fail a substitution. It wasn't wall. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't something, right? All right. Any other questions? Oops. Yes. Well, how would, so what would that expression look like? You'd have not some expression. And then if that expression the entire thing is a substitution failure. You don't, there's, it's not a piecewise substitution failure of expressions. So you don't end up, you don't, what? Right. Right, yeah. Substitution failure is a, is a final value in that, in that, in that logic. Well, it turns into Yes. Uh, yeah, they're supported. Um, th there are some interesting rules with them. I didn't. I didn't talk about them because they're not. It's more time. It's just there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, but yeah, there, you definitely write variadic concepts. Um, you can you can also declare variadic template. You can declare template parameter packs that are constrained. Um, you can declare a template parameter pack that's constrained by a variadic concept. It, it, it interplays reasonably well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the only the only thing that I would have to say about about doing that is that if you if you end up writing variadic concepts, the the checking mechanism is almost certainly going to be some kind of uh, template meta program, and so you lose the ability to do any kind of interesting like overload resolution based on that. It just becomes true or false. Anything else? All right, well then I guess I'm done. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh,